competition has been really overwhelming. It was uh, July 9th, uh, just a couple weeks ago, that Mayor Bloomberg and uh, Commissioner Wambua were, were in this very room um, announcing the program and the response that we've gotten online and in terms of RFP downloads has really been tremendous. The RFP has been downloaded uh, over 1,300 times um, in countries all over the world, including um, Copenhagen, or in cities including Copenhagen, Lima, Lima, Montreal, Taipei, Trinidad, Zurich, and our very own Staten Island. So it's really been, it's really been tremendous. Um, it's far exceeded, I think, um, any sort of RFP that, that our agencies have issued recently, and we're really excited to be here with you today. Um, the RFP represents a collaboration between uh, three of our city agencies, as well as City Hall, um, HPD in, under the leadership of Commissioner Matt Wambua, City Planning um, with Commissioner Amanda Burden, and uh, Department of Buildings with Commissioner Bob Lamondry have all been integral. And we have members of the team here today to answer questions both on the panel and in the audience for all of you. Um, so. With that said, um, let me frame this a little bit for you and then we'll kick off and, and run through the PowerPoint presentation. The Bloomberg administration has been a leader in housing innovation since the beginning of the first term. Uh, we uh, currently are implementing the new market housing place, the new housing marketplace plan, which is a multi-billion dollar initiative um, that will create and preserve over 165,000 units in New York City. Um, the program that we're presenting today, ADAPT, is the next innovation um, in that plan, and it is really innovating the housing model in addition to building more and more units. Um, ADAPT, ADAPT really takes us a step further, and we're excited to be here presenting it today. Let me give you, before we give you a brief overview, I want to introduce a couple of my colleagues who will be joining me in the presentation, Kay Matheny, who, uh, if you could stand up for a second, um, is Deputy Commissioner at the Department of Housing Preservation and Development, and Bea De La Torre, who is Assistant Commissioner for Planning. Um, in addition, on our panel, we'll have Chris Holm from City Planning, Keith Wen from the Department of Buildings, and Susan Kensky from HPD. Um, a few logistics. We have a lot of people here today, and so uh, I just want everyone to know how we're gonna run the session. Um, First of all, the HPD website, which is featured here on the PowerPoint and on all of our information, and is really the clearinghouse for information about the ADAPT program. So anytime you have a question or are looking for an update from now through throughout the program, but certainly through September 14th, the submission deadline, please check the ADAPT, the, the um, WWNYC of backslash HPD backslash ADAPT website. That is where we'll be posting all responses to questions, all additional information, and that's really like the, the point that, uh, of contact that you guys should be making. If there are questions, um, either today or for those, um, today for those who are streaming online and are not present with us, or after the session, um, all questions should be emailed to the ADAPT NYC RFP email address. Um, and that is, you know, we'll, HPD is checking that every day, and that will be the central uh, point of communication. Um, you can also follow us on Twitter, and uh, we'll be providing updates through the HPD uh, Twitter account. Um, it's very important. I know many of you signed in on your way in, or uh, there were sign-in sheets on your chairs when you walked in. It's very important to uh, give us your contact information and check the box whether or not you would like to have your contact information shared. There's a lot of people here today. I think there's probably a lot of architects and, and various members of teams that are looking to network and meet um, the others here today or who are um, joining us online. And we will be sh sharing that information with the list if you uh, choose to choose to have that um, option. Um, 
again, the conference uh, is going to be live is being live streamed on the Adapt website. And for anyone who is watching online, please email questions. There will be a Q and A session after the PowerPoint presentation. Please email your questions before the Q and A session starts, and we will try to um, address as many of those online questions as possible. Um, just so everybody knows today that the all questions that are asked, um, including the ones online and in person, um, we will be generating a Q&A sheet that will be posted by the end of the week on the ADAPT website. So there will be actual written responses to the questions asked. Okay, so with that said, um, those are the basic logistics. When we run through the PowerPoint, after we're done running through the PowerPoint, there's a microphone here at the front of the room. Um, if you have a question, we ask that you come, queue up, and ask your question from that microphone so that everyone can hear you. Um, one question per person at a time. And just a quick reminder, this is a session for applicants. So I know that there's a lot of uh, press people who are interested in um, the program. And so any press inquiries um, we should field after the Q&A. This is really uh, for applicants and respondents. OK, so with that said, um, let's kick quickly to um, our, rash our policy rationale for the program. Um, we, um, in New York City, we came to realize that the, um, that the the housing stock that we have today does not really speak to the way that New Yorkers live. And there are 1.8 million uh, small households in New York City and only about 1 million studios and one bedrooms to accommodate that population. This, this uh, competition seeks to um, design, construct, and operate a building entirely composed of small units to help meet this uh, demand within our population. A micro unit, which is uh, what we're asking for proposals on, is an innovative apartment model. It's important to note that it includes both a kitchen and bathroom, but it is smaller than what is currently allowed under regulations. Um, in, it, it, micro unit is a sort of new concept in the housing world, and the specific square footage and dimensions are still being defined. We are looking for we are looking at it as approximately 250 to 350 square feet, um, but you should all know that we are also looking for creative design. And if there are units that can be designed that are compliant with the regu with regulations, then we're more than excited to look at and review those and uh, potentially select a winner that comes in at a smaller number than that. Um, Specifically, um, what the program does um, in terms of uh, regulations and waivers, we are not, there are, there are both city, state, and federal laws that are at play in the design of uh, housing units. In this program, we are specifically waiving zoning regulations um, in order to create an entire building of these small or micro units. Um, we are not. I repeat, not waiving any of the life safety regulations that are contained within the building code. We do, however, have a section of the RFP on page 28 um, that speaks to, that asks for applicants and respondents' suggestions about in an alternate universe or an ideal world, what regulations are really the ones that you're bumping up against that are preventing you from getting those few extra square feet. Um, you should not develop a proposal that is dependent on getting a building code waiver, um, but this is your opportunity to help inform future policy and, and future decision making in this area. Um, with that said, I would like to turn the presentation over to Kay, who will give a little bit more of a description of the site um, and some of our design requirements. Thank you, Johanna, and good afternoon. As uh, Johanna said, my name is Kay Matheny, and I'm with the Department of Housing, Preservation, and Development. Um, and what I'll do is walk you through the criteria of the competition, um, starting first with the site. So the site itself is located at 335 East 27th Street, which is between Mount, Mount Carmel Place and First Avenue in the Kipps Bay neighborhood of Manhattan. This is Community District 6. Um, the site is currently, it's an HPD site, it's currently being used as a parking lot. Um, also on the block is a New York City Housing Authority development. Um, 
at the southern line of the block the southern street east twenty seventh street is actually a pedestrian walkway and across from the corner lot is a park so the lot itself is surrounded by open space um, it's also in the center of um, an institutional hub, if you will. It's a rich, vibrant institutional area. Um, it's across the street from Bellevue Hospital, um, near the NYU Medical and Dental Centers, the Veterans Affairs Hospital, among others. Um, it's also well served by retail, restaurants, and transportation. So it's within six blocks to the six train, and it's also well served by numerous buses on the avenues, as well as the nearby side streets. The lot itself is 45 by 105 feet, so close to a typical New York City block. Um, the zoning is currently R8, uh, but the city is looking to do um, a zoning map change for a commercial override for a C25 commercial. Um, that's not required. It will depend on what the proposals uh, submit, but we're considering doing that. Um, and then finally, because the, the site is a city-owned site, um, developers will have to go through the ULERP process to do a site disposition. As for the competition itself, um, some of the overall guidelines. Uh, first, starting with the team, um, we're looking for a mixed development team. Um, all teams should include a contractor, an architect, a marketing agent, and a managing agent. Um, and you should note that architects and developers, if they're interested, um, can submit more than one proposal. So um, no limitations, but it's really up to you on how much work you'd like to do and how creative you're feeling. Um, and then finally, also, um, the teams should really take into consideration the special management requirements of um, managing a building, kind of the unique considerations of managing a building full of micro units and what that might mean. Um, from a design guidelines perspective, 75% of the units, so not the floor area, but the units themselves should be micro units. That's a minimum. Um, again, our definition is somewhat flexible, so we leave it to you to think about the layout and the design of those units. Um, we're also seeking innovative design, both interior and exterior architectures, um, and with a focus on light and air, including um, external lighting to the building. Um, we're also encouraging mixed-use developments, so we're interested in seeing how creative you can get with the design and use of the space, uh, as well as creative use of uh, common spaces within the building. We think that's an important element in a building like this. And then finally, um, I think it's important to notice as or to note that with as with all HPD new construction buildings, the building must um, ad uh, adhere to the Enterprise Green Community Guidelines, which are green and sustainable guidelines. So all proposals will be evaluated on the following criteria. 30% um, of the competition will be uh, reliant on innovation of design. So including the, the key elements I mentioned previously, but all development teams should really look to the details that are included in the RFP for more of the specifics of what we're looking for. Um, we're really looking for people to push ideas, creativity, and really wow us. Um, next, 20% will go for programming and affordability mix. Um, we're really going to give preference to those buildings that have, uh, that maximize affordability and mix income levels. We're really interested in seeing how creative um, the development teams can be with mixing and affordability. Um, next, uh, the third element is around financial feasibility for the proposal. Um, we will not be providing um, city subsidy, so HPD or HDC subsidy for the building. Um, there are other options that are available, um, and a, a lot of those are listed in the RFP. Um, we can also talk through those today, but uh, we're not seeking to subsidize this directly with city funding, and we're really looking for developers and the development teams to come up with creative proposals for the financing. Um, the fourth piece is around development experience, so around experience developing and managing housing. Um, and that's 20% of the evaluation. And then the final piece, which is 10%, is really looking at um, competitive land purchase prices. So this is a, a good piece of real estate in Manhattan. Um, it's worth uh, a decent amount, and we're interested to see what you think it's worth. And um, that will be part of the evaluation criteria. So for some of the key dates, it's important for all applicants to know what the next key steps and milestones of the process are. So as Johanna mentioned, we will post um, all questions that we received today as well as online um, and answers as an addendum to our RFP on our website by Friday. Um, so let's keep those questions limited. I'm just kidding. Um, and then any following questions from today's conference, uh, we will receive through August 14th. 
uh, and then we will formally document those and publish those again as a second addendum to the RFP on our website. Um, and as Johanna mentioned, we want everybody to go to the same website for all information, and if you have questions, you can always submit them to the um, ADAPT NYC email address. Um, so all information will be posted by mid-August, and the most important date that everyone should know is September 14th. By 4 p.m., all proposals should be delivered to HPD. Um, after that, we will um, convene our selection committee and select the winner and designate the developer by the end of this calendar year, so December 2012. Um, and then our next target dates, really what we're hoping for, and we're being aggressive here, um, uh, but we hope you will be too, is a, a ULERP certification by May of 2013 and then closing of the project by next December, so December 2013. So that concludes the formal presentation. We want to spend as much time as possible going through the Q&A, but before we open it up to Q&A, I would like to introduce Bea De La Torre, who, as Johanna mentioned, is our Assistant Commissioner of Planning, and she'll go through the key questions that we've received to date. We've received a lot of questions already online. We want to cover the most frequently asked questions with formal answers before we actually open it up to remaining questions. Thank you. Thank you, Kay. So we received a numerous number of questions that we just want to go through. Um, the first one, we heard this question multiple times. Is there a way to be put on a list of interested architects who may want to be teamed up with interested developers for this RFP? And the answer is yes. So as Johanna said at the beginning, um, we are going to circulate the list of people that signed up today here. And for the ones that are remotely, the ones that are signing up through by filling out the form that's on the ADAPT NYC website. And we're going to circulate that list via email. And we're also going to post it on our website by Friday. So make sure if you have not signed up that you do so. And if you're interested in sharing your information, that you check that box saying that, yes, you want your information to be shared. The next question, um, and we receive this question quite a bit, is must TEEPS contain an architect that is registered in the United States? Um, for the purposes of the proposals, the answer is no. We do not need an architect that's registered in the US. But however, you should know that by the time filing comes for the selected proposal, um, any filing with the Department of Buildings must be done by a New York State registered architect or a licensed engineer. Okay? And that is a DOB requirement. Next is, will the proposals for the ADAPT NYC RFP need to comply with Uniform Federal Accessibility Standards, or UFAS? As stated in the RFP, yes, the proposals must comply. The developer team will be responsible to comply with all applicable federal, state, and local laws, orders, and regulations prohibiting housing discrimination. The developer must ensure that the project is designed and constructed in compliance with all laws regarding accessibility for people with disabilities, including but not limited to the New York City Building Code, the Federal Fair Housing Act, the Americans with Disability Act, and Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. We also received a financing question regarding tax exempt bonds. Can proposals utilize them? While tax exempt bonds are not prohibited, they are a limited public resource. Therefore, proposals that limit the use of public resources, such as tax exempt bonds, while maximizing affordability, will be given preference in the affordability and financial feasibility scoring components. As noted in the RFP and as said earlier, neither HPD nor HTC subsidy will be available for this project. Um, is there a parking requirement? Nope, there is no parking requirement for this site. And then lastly, are there any requirements regarding the use of union or prevailing wage labor for the construction? So the answer is no, there are no specific requirements for this RFP. The use of union or prevailing wage labor is dictated by the financing utilized and the regulations in place are not specifically for this program. So with that, we're gonna open it up uh, to questions from all of you. I just wanna state a couple of ground rules again. Uh, make sure that you come up to the microphone, speak clearly, and please identify yourself. Um, please ask one question at a time so that you all get a chance to ask questions. And for those joining us remotely, please make sure that you send your questions to the ADAPT NYC email address. Thank you, and now I'll invite the panelists to come up for the Q&A session.
great. So if um, each of the panelists could quickly identify themselves, introduce themselves and their agency, I think that would be helpful. And then again, microphones here. So if we could have uh, the pe people interested in asking questions um, queue up, that would be very helpful. Thanks. Bea de la, la Torre, can you all hear me? From the Department of Housing Preservation and Development. Chris Holm from the Department of City Planning. I'm Susan Kensky. I'm the Assistant Commissioner for New Construction at HPD. And I'm Keith Wynn from Department of Buildings. All right, so do we have any questions? Hi, my name is Augustine. I'm from SPLM Architects. Um, I just had a quick question about, what, about the decision for this particular site. What led to the picking this particular site for development? Um, so I think that that's, uh, I mean, there are several factors that went into deciding uh, a site to use. Um, it is the one that we are going with, so it's not optional, but for, I guess, everyone's uh, information, um, it was important to have a transit-oriented development, uh, development site, and, um, and the truth is that HPD has done a great job in disposing of most of their property and there's very few sites left, so. Yeah. Um, but Bea can add to that. I also wanted to add, it was very important that we pick a city on site, given that the mechanism that we're gonna utilize is a zoning override, which can only be applied for city on sites. Do we, if everyone, yeah, should just identify Hi, themselves. My name is Vincent Wong, and I'm from Studio in Chimeros. And one question about zoning. Um, the required 30 feet uh, setback, why is that? Require and also this 27th Street is that considered a map street or a park? So those are great questions. We, um, I believe Chris Holmes from City Planning would be best equipped to answer. Okay, uh, 27th Street, even though it's closed automobiles, it's a map street. Um, and uh, 30 feet is required. Uh, the reason for that is uh, a long history of uh, public concern for light and air. So uh, 30 feet is required between any legal windows and a lot line. But even though the, the site doesn't, the zoning doesn't require that 30 feet. Well, uh, you're, you're you know, the, that the, that's, that's the way the other lot is today, but in the future, theoretically, the other lot could be built in some other configuration. So this is, it's a rule that applies citywide and allows, because we don't know what adjacent lots will be doing. So we treat the adjacent lot as if a building was there. So that's why 30 feet is required to, between a legal window and a lot line. Okay, thank you. Adam French, Smith and Others Architects. Which side of the property is the zoning front yard and which side will be the side yard? So Chris and Keith are probably, Chris, why don't you kick off? The, uh, the two street lines are front lot lines and the other two lot lines are side lot lines. Were you counting the pedestrian walkway as a... As a street line. As mm -hmm. a street line. So yes. have, to clarify, my understanding is right, that there's two front yards? Well, there are no yard requirements in R8, but there's two front lot lines, yes. And uh, one more question is, um, the zoning guidelines that I've read do not define how many rooms a micro unit is. Will you be issuing a number of rooms for a micro unit? Uh, no, no, there's, uh, that's not determined by zoning or by our RFP. But, uh, you know, building code says something about the minimum size of the rooms, which has something to do with your, what your design will be. Hi, uh, Jim Garrison, Garrison Architects. Uh, your um, proposal states the threshold qualifications for developers as requiring that they have specific experience with mixed income units. So my question is uh, that, I guess my statement is that that tends to limit the number of developers who might uh, participate. And do you see uh, loosening that up a bit so we can invite a broader uh, crew? So HPD is, is best equipped to answer the question. <clears throat> but as we said, sort of in the introduction, um, first of all, um, as long as people maintain internal separation between applications, we have made it possible 
um, for developers to submit with multiple architects. Um, but specifically to the requirements about development experience, HPD um, can speak best to it. So that is correct. That is part of the threshold requirements that there's experience with mixed use and mixed income. We would like to see affordability included into this project. Um, and that basically is one way of enhancing and mentioning that point. Well, OK. We, we, we know developers who have both affordability experience and have market rate experience, but not necessarily having combined them in the same building. So it becomes extremely specific and, ex mm -hmm. and starts to become exclusive at, the, at this point. We basically, you should provide a justification on how your experience meets the requirement and we will certainly look at it and. Okay, thanks. Are there any other yeah. questions? Uh, Great. Andrew Bradfield, Orange Management. Um, so let's see, one question. On page 15 there was a reference to uh, subordinated city debt. Is there any uh, any contemplation of uh, the city holding paper or you know, uh, issuing a installment purchase of the land so that uh, you, you back end your, your a portion of the, of the acquisition payment? Right, that would depend on the proposal that's presented to us, um, both in terms of the affordability and also the purchase price. So there would be variations depending upon what the purchase price would be. Okay. Uh, and then on the, the, the prerequisite related to the developer experience, you said uh, uh, mixed income is the, the term or affordability experience? That's, what, you know, what uh, other than having done an affordable housing building, what, what mixed income, what specifically is the definition of that? Um, you basically, so an affordable housing building would fit into that definition, so you should explain what that building was and um, how your experience matches the requirement. Okay, and, and, and to follow up on the uh, last question, the, uh, that prerequisite is a hard and fast one or it's one you're, you, 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 uh, you're entertaining other uh, explanations as to how that's gonna be addressed? We def our, our ultimate goal here is to ensure that the project gets built. So it is important for us to assess um, and review proposals and ultimately select a team that will be able to effectively deliver the project. So we definitely do look at that um, in terms of is it a has and fast rule. Um, even though those are the parameters that we set, we always look at justifications on how you believe your experience approximates it. Okay, and same thing for the 75 unit uh same thing. Prerequisite. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Hi, Michael Barry, Iron State Development. The uh, the panel that'll select the uh, the applicant is it all within HPD? Will you have outside architects? Will you have other disciples in there? Could you give us a little bit of uh, an idea of what the makeup <coughs> of the, the jury will be? So, um, so your question, just to make sure, is in terms of who's going to be reviewing the proposals and selecting. So the team that will review is an interagency team composed by members of HPD, Department of Buildings, um, City Planning, Mayor's Office, and HDC, our partner. Um, and we will be reviewing all the proposals and then selecting collaboratively. Howdy. Uh, Charlie Perla with DMS Perla. Uh, I guess my question goes back to the rationale be behind how you allotted the, the point system. The, the way it, it, I see it, 70%, which is in high school a C, gets you in, so to speak. But you seem to be looking for a lot of design, as all our clients are. But I'm, I'm wondering whether or not that percentage could be varied uh, so that there's more weight given towards the architectural design aspect that would probably have a lot more to do with coming up with creative solutions. That, yeah, that's 30% right there. Uh, I mean, a, 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 a rich one percentile individual seeking national recognition would buy the land and 
well, no, no, I'm getting political here, sorry. But so my question is, I, I'm trying to think of how is it that we got to that 30 percent, and 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 how is it that the purchase of the land is worth, well, you know, a okay. third of what the architectural. So I think that we can. The design guidelines within the RFP speak to this a little bit. When we say design, we both mean interior and exterior design of the building, but particularly we're talking about the interior design of the building, how the space is used, what kind of light and air is coming into the unit. And you know, with these, with a new innovative housing model um, and with building sort of the first building of micro units in New York City, we feel that um, 30% really speaks to livability of the unit and how you use design to enhance a very small space. I don't know if HPD city or city planning would like to add. Um, so I'll just say 30% is still the highest one out of all the criteria that we have. In addition, in, in experience, um, we also do look at the experience of the architecture team. So that is also another component of architecture that's ingrained into the current um, percentages and I, th I think I might have heard a question if there was the potential for flexibility in changing that at this point and the answer is no that these this is the way this is the RFP is going to be scored next question from anyone in the audience you guys can come up to the mic hi Michael Barry again I State development uh, I know the uh, the zoning regulation or the building regulation for the size of the unit is obviously being um, relaxed with respect to this for the micro units. Are there any other um, bulk or other, other parameters that are being relaxed or are you looking for us to potentially put in a conforming bid and a non-conforming bid that might um, relax other bulk requirements? So uh, very good question. The zoning, we were very clear in the presentation and I believe in the RFP about specifically which to zoning requirements will be relaxed as the density and also the minimum size, as you say. Um, I think that city planning can answer the question more fully, but I would start by saying in your proposals, you should not assume that any additional zoning uh, variances or waivers will be given. Um, we will consider, um, so be conservative about it. Um, we will consider, um, zoning waivers that uh, speak directly to the policy um, agenda that we laid out on the first slide. Um, Chris, would you like to add? Actually, I think uh, Joanna said it very well. That's, we'll consider it if it's directly related to the kind of project that we're looking for. And just to reiterate, um, we said this in the presentation, but just to be clear, there's no building code waivers um, or housing maintenance code or ADA accessibility uh, waivers available. Yep. Hi, Mark Alexander, Alexander Development Group. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Um, in the marketing section, uh, the, it seemed to suggest that the HPD marketing guidelines would apply to all units. Is, uh, is that accurate or uh, are those simply for the affordable units? The marketing guidelines would apply for the to the affordable units. Okay. Uh, second, um, <clears throat> I'm going to push back again on this um, rear yard requirement issue. This is a corner lot. Uh, typically, rear yards are not required on corner lots in this type of zone. If windows aren't on that side of the property, are only on the street frontage sides, I'm uh, a little con confused as to why uh, it would be required on this lot. So your question specifically <clears throat> speaks to a building that is designed without windows on that rear yard? Correct. Right, then you, there is no required rear, rear yard, it's a corner lot. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. That's an important clarification for a whole lot of people in this room. <laughs> just, uh, just, just to be clear, to be, just that's to be clear, a though. windowless side of the building. Yeah, uh, any legally required windows facing that side would trigger the 30 yeah. feet. Uh, understood. If there are no legally required windows, then there's no trigger. Well, so and, if you have a design I that's... I probably should add that there are lot coverage regulations right. and so on. Uh, and, and, and this is, uh, I believe, uh, quality housing is required. Does, there are a whole bunch of quality housing-like requirements. Is it explicitly uh, required that the building adhere to all quality housing standards? That's a very good question. Um, and 
The answer is no, but go ahead, Chris. Yeah, no, it's, it's in an R8, which allows height factor buildings right. as well. Which leads to the next question, which is the height of the units. Is there any limitation on height of units uh, um, uh, that would prohibit the uh, ability to put in um, loft-style sleeping areas in some of the units? R8 uh, allows a uh, sky exposure plan, as you know, and uh, it also allows the option of quad housing with the setback uh, at uh, 80 feet, I believe, is the maximum base height. Okay, final question has to do with operating issues. Um, the uh, property management of, a type, of this type of property uh, would suggest that many of the residents uh, may want leases of less than 12 months. Uh, typically in, in uh, newcomer apartments, people may want to stay as little as three months. Is there any limitation on the ownership with respect to the tenure of tenancy? So um, that's a good question. In terms of operation, I think it's, it's important that these be residential units. But as you pose the question, three months, um, that it, you don't have to adhere to a traditional 12-month uh, uh, lease term. However, I believe, and DOB and HPD can correct me, that anything less than one month is uh, not considered residential. And so we are not looking to have um, a hoteling style situation. In fact, the building operation piece of the RFP speaks specifically to, one of our goals in that is specifically to prevent that kind of dwelling. Thank you. Do you guys have anything to um, add? Yeah, I, I'm Keith from DOB. Just want to add back, add, add a little uh, onto the loft uh, question. Uh, if you're creating a loft space and having a mezzanine uh, within a unit, uh, there are some additional requirements in Chapter 12 of the Building Code requiring you know, the same light and air, uh, as well as uh, um, uh, egress uh, for the mezzanine level. And um, I think Chris can probably clarify that also for zoning purposes. Uh, don't forget that if it's a habitable mezzanine, then you're getting into floor area issue. So. Augustine from SBLM Architects. Um, I'm a little confused about the uh, definition. Can of you speak a little oh, into sure. the microphone? I want to make sure I everyone just want a clarification on the word um, model um, micro micro unit. Like, is it? Should we interpret this as a prototypical building or one that's kind of more specific to this particular site? One that can be probably, you know, modified to another site? Yeah, the, the goal of this program is, is certainly to scale this type of mo housing model to other sites in the future. We are looking at one site now and, uh, and you know, look to develop a building on the East 27th Street. However, if this building is successful and if we can um, execute certain legislative changes, this is a model that we'd like to introduce to New York City, but that's further down the road. Starling Keem from Shop Architects. Uh, just given the nature of the kind of experimental tininess of these units, and understanding that the building code must be met in its entirety, is there any flexibility on the kind of should, must language included in the HPD uh, room planning guidelines, the size of the appliances and all that kind of stuff? Sure, so one, let me just uh, say one thing. The, to be clear, uh, units <sighs> like this exist today. Um, New Yorkers live in this amount of square footage frequently, in fact, uh, there's plenty of them who have emailed us and said that they live in even smaller units and want to, you know, participate in the program in some way, shape, or form, even down to like 100 square feet. Um, so this is a this is a type of housing that exists. I think the sort of new um, piece that we're introducing is that this would be an entire building um, where many, if not, you know, we're asking for a minimum of 75 percent. So met, the majority of the units would be the smaller in the smaller size. But um, to speak specifically to your question, which was on building code? Um, HPD. Oh, HPD guidelines. guidelines. Sure. In the RFP, I think we um, make this clear, but Bea. So, um, so you're referring to the HPD design guidelines for new construction. Um, and we 
made it clear in the RFP that the ADAPT NYC design guidelines that are included in section 3D supersede the HPD design guidelines where there is conflict. Um, in the parts where there is no conflict, um, we expect you to follow the HPD design guidelines if there is flexibility in terms of the sh should versus must in those areas that do not conflict. Um, we, you can provide a strong justification and we can look at it. Thank you. Hi, Shai, G55 Architects. Uh, my question is uh, specifically regarding the micro units. I know that a lot of people here are looking to brainstorm and try to develop good units. Uh, my question is how closely you're going to look and examine not only uh, the units in terms of uh, ADA adaptability, uh, but also constructability regarding, you know, chase walls and shaft walls and ductwork and so on. Because uh, apparently the layouts that showed, that showed up on the RFP are not exactly, uh, cannot exactly accommodate all of that. So this, um, we are looking for proposals that can actually be built on this site. Um, and so they would need to comply with ADA accessibility and they would need to be a functional building that ha has the workable ductwork and other things that you mentioned. Um, so it's important for any proposal being submitted to comply and be buildable. Um, and so there will be a thorough review. H Bay, I don't know if you... Absolutely. So they do need to comply with all federal um, standards as well. And I will take this opportunity quickly to um, introduce John Garrity, who's the Assistant Commissioner for Design at HPD, and he can talk a little bit more specifically on how that portion will be reviewed. Hi. Um, uh, I thought I was getting out of this. Um, <laughs> in addition to the normal New York City Chapter 11 building code requirements uh, as a federal housing agency, we are required to comply with Section 504, the UFAS standard, which will, as was mentioned before, which will be and is viewed by HUD as uh, beyond fair housing, beyond the, the city building code. So um, there will be no waivers in that regard. I don't know if I heard the exact question. Um, well, and as far as, oh, your other questions on the design layouts in the RFP were for illustrative purposes and were not to be uh, viewed as compliant. Um, and that's the challenge that's posed to all of you. Thanks. Are there additional questions for people in the room? Um, if so, please try to make your way to the microphone if you could. Actually, since you have to backtrack, why don't I? <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is James McCuller. And this is a zoning question. Um, at the moment, the site is on a narrow, narrow street, so it would, uh, on, for quality housing, so it would have to use the lower FAR and the lower uh, height restrictions. But it is across the street from a large playground. And uh, although it's not contiguous with that playground, would the presence of that playground allow it, would the zoning allow and the series of waivers to uh, let it be considered uh, as a equivalent to a wide street for the sake of its one frontage? Uh, no, well, not, a, not as of right. Um, if you feel that, uh, I, th I think this question touches a little bit on uh, zoning overrides, and I would repeat what we said before that uh, don't assume that uh, if you design a building that exceeds height limit, if you design a building based on it being a wide street, even though it's not, uh, that uh, a zoning will provide to uh, accommodate that design will be forthcoming. Uh, don't assume that. Uh, but if, you, if it's essential to the project and you can argue that, we will consider it. Are there any other questions from people either in the balcony or upstairs um, viewing through simulcast. Um, if so, please make your way down. Um, if not, we'll take a couple questions um, from people online after Rick Bell gets a chance to ask a question. Um, we'll take a couple of questions that we've received from uh, people watching on uh, streaming. And uh, again, if there are any questions you know, that you have after this conference, please email them to the ADAPT uh, email address and they will be answered. Bef um, all questions must be received by August 14th in order to be answered in the RFP 
uh, before the RFP is due. Yes, Rick? A uh, very quick question for everybody in the room. First of all, I want to thank the panel and the agency's representative for um, putting this together and for uh, both announcing it and making this session happen here at the Center for Architecture. But my question uh, is who's here? Uh, I know there'll be a sign-in list and probably people will all say I'm at this firm or that firm or this type of entity. But just by show of hands, could I ask how many people in the room are architects or trained as architects? <laughs> Telling. Uh, developers or trained as developers? <laughs> um, reporters? Others, to be specified. <laughs> thank you, and thank you all for coming. Um, Might I ask a one follow-up question, zoning question? Sure. And this is a question out of left field. Since the site is in the middle of a large NYCHA site that's whose uh, floor area is underutilized, uh, and, it would, and, and also uh, it has a lot of open space, has, would there be any thought given to doing a combined zoning lot that would alleviate the uh, window, lot line window issues? Um, so that it's true the only other building on the lot is a NYCHA uh, development. Um, a development proposal can be submitted that contemplates FAR being transferred. That would all be through private transactions. NYCHA is a, uh, you know, dual, feder or dual federal city state um, entity and they often sell and transact their air rights with uh, property owners on blocks that they share. It would not be part of, it would not be something that the city would provide for free. Um, okay, so with that said, I think um, we have one more question at least. Hi, yeah. Luca Barone from Blesso Properties. I just have a question regarding the completeness checklist, otherwise known as Form A. It lists a commercial or community facility plan under tab N of the sub required submission, whereas page 28 of the RFP texts puts an optional new housing paradigm under tab N. So I'm wondering if those are both the same, those are two separate things, and if they are separate, where we should be putting them in the submission? Um, I, we will get back to you on that because I don't have all the tabs in front of me, so we will make sure we clarify that, but thank you for pointing that out. Okay, so there's a couple questions that we received from uh, those who are watching online. Um, one, will the presentations be uploaded separately um, and will the tape presentation be uploaded on YouTube? Um, again, please, um, the, the PowerPoint presentation is actually available online on the HPD website as we speak. Um, so that presentation is available to all of you and ever, anyone who's uh, viewing outside of the AIA. Um, in terms of a tape presentation, please check the website for updates. We will try to do that uh, to put a version of this uh, session up there. It will likely not be on YouTube, although it may be a link. So um, that's number one. Number two, are all micro units to be ADA compliant um, or will, lit will limited percentage require compliance? We've answered this, but just to be totally clear, Bea. <laughs> Yes, they all have to be compliant. Um, can a team of architects who don't have a letter of intent for financing still participate in the competition? The winning team pending, um, they did their due diligence and on the business plan side, would they have an easy time finding cash and winning the competition? <laughs> it's a little editorial. <laughs> um, so we can uh, try to parse this question a little bit and write back in, in, uh, in written form. Um, but I, I think the, essential, the essence of the question is, can an architect apply without a fi letter of finance? Without a finance application? Yeah. Um, so the answer to the question is the, the proposals need to be complete um, in order for us to consider them. So all proposals should include the financing portion. It's a very important part of it. All the requirements of everything that needs to be included are spelled out in section five of the RFP. Um, and I believe we've asked this as well, but in the in interest of being comprehensive, will there be a variance on the maximum number of dwelling units per development uh, zoning article two, section 23-22? Believe that those are the density requirements that we are overriding as part of the RFP and a presentation, Chris. Is that right? That's right. It's, it's, well, uh, technically, it's a zoning override. 
but yes, we're waiving that particular requirement, yes. Okay, so with that said, we have one or two more questions. Yeah, okay. A short question. Marie um, Surtao is my name, and I'm Aldea Project. Um, you already told us about 80 feet, that's the maximum height of the building. Is that right? Um, well, you can check for yourself. I believe uh, maximum base height is 80 feet, uh, but after setback, then it can go up to, I don't know, off the top of my head, 100 and some odd feet. In our RA district, that's if you build it according to quality housing. It's, uh, you know, that information is easy to get. Okay. Um, and there's any specific information about the height of the mm -hmm. micro unit? Maximum, minimum? So I believe that that was asked in terms of the lofted dwelling uh, question. Yeah, we, probably I we don't have height or ceiling requirements. There is, as Chris just outlined, uh, building setback requirements. But uh, Keith. Yeah, so like the, 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 there's a minimum height requirement for habitable spaces within a unit. It's eight feet. And then also for habitable mezzanine is also eight feet. You can feel free to go beyond that, but I don't know if that's going to be your advantage of fitting in all the no, micro the units. No, the idea is to increase it. As you increase it? Yeah. I'm not sure what you mean. To increase the height of the, the micro units. Oh, yeah. Yes, you I can mean, you, you can do 10 feet, 11, 15, but, you know. Okay. Um, another question is uh, about basement. No problem with that? What do you mean about basement? Well, can there be dwelling units in the basement? No, not dwelling no. units. <laughs> you mean that the building can have a basement? Yeah. yeah. The, the, there's nothing prohibiting a basement. You can have bicycle storage. You can have anything you want. But if it's a common area accessible to all tenants, then you have to provide access to that level as well. And if you want to have any sort of habitable space within the basement it has to fully uh, it has to meet building code and zoning. Okay. But you bring up an interesting point, which we've highlighted in the PowerPoint presentation and we'll do again, which is that uh, the common spaces within the building are something that we're looking at very carefully. So innovation, creativity, and uh, design solutions around common and shared space within the building, since the dwelling spaces are going to be rather small, um, is highly encouraged and we're looking for proposals that um, that think creatively about that shared space. Thank you. I have a question about, uh, Matt Blesso, Blesso Properties, a question about affordability of the market rate units. Judging by the amount of people here and the amount of interest that you're getting, I think you're going to end up with something that's pretty spectacular design-wise. And that also is going to drive the market in terms of what people are willing to pay for these units on the, in terms of the market rate ones. How, in, but you also mentioned affordability as a component here. Are the market rate units, are they tied to any uh, fixed rent? Can, can the, you know, the developer charge whatever they want? Is it, are you hoping to set and limit the level? And before you answer, I guess keep in mind that, you know, the lower or the, the more that a developer is going to get for market rate units, the more that they can pay for the land. And so that will factor into the proposal. Yeah, there's a couple different level levers that we are looking for competition around in the RFP. One of them you identify is land price. Another is affordability. Um, Bay can speak uh, in greater detail, but we are looking for mixed income building. Um, right. So we basically leave it up to you to see what you come up with um, in terms of the market rate. It's market rate. It's there's no cap um, in terms of the affordability. We would like to see affordability in the building, and that is one of the competitive criteria, higher percent, you know, a percentage of affordability, but we don't have a maximum prescribed in the RFP. So we, we leave it up to you. Or a minimum, for that matter, right? Or minimum or a maximum. I'm sorry, a minimum. <laughs> I meant a minimum. I apologize. OK, are there additional uh, people who have questions who have not yet made their way to the microphone? If not, um, I just wanted to thank you guys all for attending today. I know it's a little hot in here, but it um, hopefully has been a helpful session. And we really appreciate all of the interest and look forward to seeing your proposals on September 14th. Thank you.